Good afternoon. Welcome to our fourth and final program to help prepare us for the upcoming West Mexico Ritual and Identity Exhibition, which will run June 26th through November 6th. I want to thank all of you for participating. I think most of you in the room have been to now all four of the programs, and I, I hope you've enjoyed them. I've had a lot of good feedback from you on the programs and how beneficial they are. And even before I introduce our speaker today, I want to thank Bob Pickering for helping make all of this possible. So let's get Bob in for that. As I just alluded, our final lecture today, we have a scholar that many of us know from his time here with us at Gilcrease Museum, Dr. Bob Pickering. In fact, if you have checked your mailbox in the last few days, you've received the museum member magazine and the exhibition, West Mexico Ritual and Identity, is the cover story. And there's lots of good information in there, but it just scratches the surface compared to what we've had the past several weeks. Dr. Pickering received his Ph.D. in Physical Anthropology from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, in 18... I'm sorry. I live in the past. He received his Ph.D. in 1984 after earning his B.A. and M.A. degrees in anthropo Anthropology from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Bob now serves as Professor of Anthropology as well as the Founding Director of the Museum Science and Management M.A. program at the University of Tulsa. He also serves as Adjunct Curator of Anthropology at Gilchrist Museum. Today's program gives us an insight into what Bob and Cheryl Smallwood Roberts have developed for the West Mexico Exhibition. Dr. Pickering began, his, began working in northern and western Mexico as a student. His research into mortuary behavior and human osteology led him to the study of ceramic human figures, which this exhibit will have many of. As a museum-based anthropologist, Bob attempts to recontextualize collections through detailed examination and the use of innovative technologies. The upcoming exhibition, West Mexico Ritual and Identity, has spawned a number of new publications that Bob has been involved with. He and his colleague, Dr. Christopher Beekman, who presented the second lecture about two weeks ago in our <coughs> series, co-chaired a symposium at the 2014 meeting of the Society of American Archaeology, which has culminated in the book Shack Tombs and Figures in West Mexican Society, a Reassessment. West Mexico Ritual and Identity, the catalog for the exhibition, authored by Dr. Pickering, is written <coughs> for the general public. But besides that, the research that has produced the exhibition has also produced the visual guide to Occidente Shaft Tomb Ceramic Figures, authored by Bob and Cheryl Smallwood Roberts, which is a lab manual for studying West Mexico's enigmatic ceramic figures. Dr. Pickering has also authored five other books and more than 60 articles for academic and general audiences. Most notable are Peace Medals, Negotiating Power in Early America, which was an exhibit, I guess the first exhibit that your museum studies group put together. The Use of Forensic Anthropology and Seeing the White Buffalo. Let's welcome Dr. Bob Pickering. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here again, and it's good to uh, to bring see this exhibit coming to fruition. We've been working on this a long time. Uh, one of the unsung heroes in this project is Cheryl Smallwood Roberts, back there in the back. Uh, she started as a student in the MSM program, and uh, once I discovered she had artistic talents, all of which I lack, uh, we were able to press her into service to do some innovative things that you will see. And then when I found out that she had designed books, well, obviously we took advantage of those skills as well. And so uh, Cheryl has uh, spent most of the last couple of years down in a little cubicle doing extraordinary work 
And so now we're both thrilled to see some of this coming to the public. Uh, I am particularly thrilled because in one way or another, I've been working on West Mexican material for 30 years uh, from different perspectives and in different ways. Uh, but it has been great fun. It's been a terrific journey. So uh, the exhibit will hopefully uh, be as enjoyable for you and the audiences that, that we all serve uh, uh, as the exhibit opens. Well, a little recap. You've had three previous um, uh, discussions. Mike Whalen from the Anthro Department here at TU uh, essentially tried to set a broad Mesoamerican context, looking at the major West Mex uh, sorry, the, the major Mesoamerican cultures that you are probably much more familiar with. The Aztec, the Maya, the Toltecs. So he's he's sort of painting broad stroke uh, picture of Mesoamerica. Chris Beekman, uh, his task was to try to connect West Mexico with the greater Mesoamerican world. Herman Viola, who was here last time, although he was talking about a more recent time period, his exhibit and catalog, Seeds of Change, it was really a pivotal event in the museum world looking at the Colombian exchange in both directions. What I'm going to try to do today, without hitting my microphone too often, uh, what I'm going to try to do today is give you some context and some details on the actual exhibit that we're doing. What a shock. Um, we're, we're, I'm going to talk about some details. Uh, hopefully you'll have questions to ask, and we will just continue on when I figure out where we're going. Okay, that's how that works. Um, I want to point out, first of all, this terrific illustration. We had two illustrations made by Herb Rowe, who is an illustrator who has done a number of illustrations and murals based on archaeological subjects. What I think is important for you to know is that for this figure, who is a flyer, sometimes associated with the Volador ceremony, and for this ball game player, both of these figures are in, are, both of these illustrations are based on figures in the Oak Reese collection. So what we're trying to do, one of the things I'm trying to do, is to bring West Mexico alive, to have people see these ancient people as people, not just as shades of the past, not just as, uh, as figures in a display case. Uh, it's important to recognize these individuals, these people, and their great accomplishments. What you're looking at here uh, is uh, a reconstruction of uh, the Guachimontong um, uh, site near Tenchitlan, uh, or near Itzablan in, in uh, West Mexico. Um, and here is a cross section done by one of my earlier colleagues uh, showing what this, this complex looks like in cross section. In the center, a large platform pyramid mound, we'll talk about that later that's surrounded by a circular plaza that itself is then surrounded by a series of raised banquettes or platforms on which there are houses and temples. Now, this is complex society. This is planned architecture. In this particular instance, this is a major city. How many people live there? We don't really know. It could number in the low thousands. But what we know is that there are smaller farmsteads where you may have only one of these complexes, and those may have been inhabited by a small number of families who were out working in the fields, essentially. But the pattern, the circular pattern, is significant, and it's very different from the rest of Mesoamerica, although the idea of, oops, sorry about that, the idea of a sacred area, sacred precinct, uh, as part of the living area, that's, that's not particular to West Mexico. That's, that's a pretty common uh, Mesoamerican trait. So, we will now go on. Well, one of the, the things that we need to talk about a little bit is where is West Mexico? By now, hopefully you know where that is. Um, this is a map that will be available and we'll talk about it. This map is actually in the um, symposium volume that was referred to earlier. And what we've tried to do here is point out where the various articles in the volume come from. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of geography uh, in that. 
And then maybe a question is, why are we doing this exhibit? And why are we doing it now? Well, uh, one of the things I was thrilled to see when I came here six years ago or so, hard to believe it's been six years, uh, is to find out that uh, in the mid part of the 20th century, uh, Thomas Gilcrease put together a pretty significant collection of these West Mexican figures and vessels, something over 400 items. Um, and as you all know, uh, these have been on display, some of them have been on display uh, for years, but uh, here's this part. They're on display, but they haven't really been interpreted. Uh, they are what they are, they're interesting pieces, but unless you've got some context for understanding them, they're just neat clay figures. That's all they are. Well, uh, in the last couple of years, we've been doing some fairly significant research uh, on the West Mexican collection here, and the exhibit will talk about that. And uh, through that research and through our work with some of the scholars uh, in the symposium volume, we are coming up with some new interpretations. One of the things I'm pleased about in the academic symposium volume is that we have authors from, I think, four or five different countries. So this is a real international effort. Okay? The goals of the exhibit are pretty simple. Uh, we would like to help bring ancient West Mexico alive for today's audiences. We want to explore the science behind our interpretation. As a museum guy, one of the things that's kind of important to me is, is particularly for young audiences, is the idea that in science, not all the good stuff's been done yet. There are lots of discoveries yet to be made, and your young audiences may be the ones making those discoveries in the future. So uh, to look at the science behind our interpretations, I think is very important. And then this one is really also important too. Um, the objects, I think, are interesting enough on their own, but there are generations of artists, not only in Mexico, but around the world, who have used uh, aspects of these, uh, these ceramic figures in their own modern and contemporary work. That should tell you that these objects still have power. They still have resonance with, uh, with contemporary artists, and that's a very important thing. Well, who were the West Mexicans? To a large extent, uh, the picture is fairly blank in terms of information. Um, this culture that we're talking about, about 2,000 years old, meaning that it's about 1,500 years before the Aztecs. They did not speak Nahuatl like the Aztecs. Uh, they did not have the same religion, although there are some things they may well have shared. We don't know what these people call themselves. We're not even for sure what language they spoke. So the ability to help find these people and to help them tell their story to us takes some considerable research. Well, in West Mexico, it covers a number of states. We, you saw from the map, it's Jalisco and, and uh, Nayarit and Colima and parts of Sinaloa and Michoacan. And within that region, there are lots of different styles of figures. Well, what, what do those styles mean? Do they represent different cultures? Are they different time periods on the same piece of landscape? Are they different sort of micro locations within that landscape? Or do these figures have different functions? Well, part of what we're going to try to do in the exhibit is to address some of those questions. Part of the answer is they're different polities. And by polities, I mean uh, sort of different groups. If you think of the idea of a city-state or a town-state as a polity, these would be different town-states within the same region. They were probably competitive with each other, but they also probably shared lots of cultural and religious traits. So if your interest is more in the, let's say, the Greek and Roman, the classical period, you're probably familiar with the idea of the Athenians versus the Spartans versus the other groups. Well, that may not be a terrible analogy initially for this part of the world, too. Um, Different functions is one we're going to spend some time talking about in the exhibit. But 
what I want to do in this exhibit is to get beyond style. Now, I'm going to say something impolite about art historians in archaeology. Frequently, they are more interested in attributes of style, in form, in color, in design, and all that sort of stuff. But, and there has been some very good work in West Mexico, but unfortunately, they don't always go beneath style to find other information. And what we find in West Mexico is there are very clear differences in gender, in how people dress, in what they wear, in the type of body decoration, even in body postures to some extent. So they are characterizing men and women very differently. We also know in West Mexico that they depict different ages. Mothers and children, old people, well, that's kind of interesting. If you look at most archaeological ceramic figures or stone figures, and if you're thinking of the Maya, the Aztecs, and the Toltecs, as you might, remember, those are state religions, and they're, they're presenting a much more formalized view of the human figure. Whereas in West Mexico, this seems to be more informal. Uh, Hasso von Winning, back in the 1970s, called these figures anecdotal figures. He called them or suggested that they were more like snapshots of real life. To some extent, I agree with that, although that, that interpretation may be a little simplistic. It was good for the time, but today it may be a little simplistic. We also know that uh, for both men and women, we have a range of depictions. Uh, some are depicted in, uh, in uh, clothing and accoutrement that suggest that they are, are warriors. Uh, this person is wearing this, this uh, you see this sort of high collar? This is probably a wicker or rattan type uh, uh, body armor with a helmet, and he is carrying either a club or a mace, um, and sort of in a defensive position. We see this individual seated, carrying what is probably a fan, Remember that uh, uh, on the first image, the, uh, 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 the Herb Rowe exhibit, one of the guys is, uh, is carrying fans. That's probably what this is, a feathered fan. He's wearing a headdress that is an animal skin. These are actually feet. Some of these actually have the head of the animal as well as the feet. So we see that there's some great detail in the depiction of men and women. Women tend to have uh, a, a couple of different postures. This kneeling posture, frequently they are carrying a bowl, uh, either uh, at one shoulder or the other, sometimes on the head. Frequently women are, are depicted in a kneeling position uh, with hands on the abdomen, probably related to pregnancy, childbirth, first child. There are a number of interpretations we could make of this, and part of what we're trying to do is, is to see, you know, how do, how do we do this? And then the big question is, are these individuals real individuals? Are these stylized ancestors? Are they deities? Are they deity impersonators? Um, that's one of the big questions. <clears throat> also in West Mexico, we are blessed with a whole range of ceramic figures that depict scenes. And if you look at them in detail, the individuals here are dressed and often carry the accoutrement just like the large individual figures. They're telling the same story. They're showing some of the same activities. Uh, the body painting uh, on this individual depicts her as female. She's carrying a bowl on her head with these, with these spheres. Um, that has been interpreted as food. It's also possible that those are bowls of incense for, for uh, ritual purposes. Uh, in this situation, this is a village scene. They're, this group of individuals is marching towards this structure. They're being met. There's this person right here. Okay. There's a, a welcoming group. He's blowing a conch shell trumpet. They're carrying on their shoulders this large structure that probably is decorated with feathers. Is that, is that a, a body? Is that a, uh, a ritual gift? We don't know for sure, but we're getting at that. 
and we see details of activity. Here we see a house structure with people inside. We see people doing things. These are not abstract. Well, they're abstract in form, but they're probably pretty realistic in terms of identifying real events and real activities if we take the time to look at them in detail. And over the last half dozen years, that's really what we've been trying to do here. Um, this is a, a tableau from the Denver Art Museum. This is one of my favorites. It's a, a dance group. It's a ritual going on. You have a man standing right here who's right in the middle. He's being encircled by all these folks. And next to him is a, a, probably a singer, a musician, uh, given his accoutrement. And what you see in this ring around him is everybody's locked arm in arm, but it's woman, man, woman, man, woman, man, all around. Okay, the women are all dressed the, uh, more or less the same way. They have body decoration in the same way. The men are all wearing sort of the same men outfits, men decoration. This is a real activity. And, and here at the edge is a house. So they're doing this in this sort of central plaza area. And if you could look straight down, which you can on the slide, there's actually um, sort of a white spiral painted on the bottom of this that leads from the center and goes to the edge it suggests that this is a path going from the middle outside the village. That's my interpretation, at least. So there are activities here that we can sort of parse apart and find more information about these things than we could if we look at them just as interesting ceramic figures. Well, Variation in detail and quality. You saw this image before. Do you notice what he's carrying right here? And this is one of our pieces. That is a turtle shell, and that is a deer antler baton. Guess what? So is that. What's the difference? Artistry. Manufacture. This is a large hollow figurine. This is probably 20, 25 inches tall at least. This is, these are masterful examples. They are very detailed. But look at the male figures. Wearing a cape over one shoulder, cape over one shoulder. Turtle shell, turtle shell. Deer antler, deer antler. Nose ornament, nose ornament. Ear ornaments, ear ornaments. Uh, coiled headband, coiled headband. Although he's wearing one that also has the, uh, the footed animal form. My point in this is, this helps us understand who is making these figures and maybe who their clients were. There is a significant difference in quality here. This is a master ceramicist. This person, probably not. Or at least they were in a really big hurry, one or the other. But they're depicting the same individual or the same ritual activity. Now, here is Codex, and I won't even try to pronounce that, uh, which is a mid-16th century Aztec book. What's this guy doing? Turtle shell? Antler. He's singing. And in the text of this Codex, it says that this is a singer who performs at the death of kings. Hmm, isn't that interesting? This is 1,500 years later than those two earlier figures. And yet, also, he's got a, a cloak over one shoulder. There, there's considerable time depth to some of these rituals. That's kind of interesting to see. It means that for the Mesoamerican traditions, there, there is some very deep time associated with some of the deities and some of the rituals. It's dangerous to simply take something like this from the time of contact and use it wholesale to interpret the things that are 1,500 years earlier. But it is okay to sort of use this as a model and ask the question, what's the context in which this is done? Who did this? Who was it done for? And then to see if we can test that, those ideas, with uh, archaeological data from long ago. 
Well, one of the things I have tried to do for lots and lots of years, because I'm sort of a gadget guy as long as I'm not the one responsible for making it work, um, to use different kinds of techniques for analysis. When we do visual examination, yeah, we can understand or we can observe style and form and the external descriptions and all that sort of stuff. We can look at, at surface treatment and we can do some metric analysis. We can, we can measure things. But if we use computed axial tomography, and we'll look at that in a minute, that helps us look into the piece and gives us more detail of how that piece was manufactured. It tells us about the repair history of that piece. It can tell us how the individual artist created the object and is that consistent with how other objects of the same form were created, which might let us tell the difference between one artist and another. As you, many of you know, I've been using medical endoscopy, although now I have my own, and so I don't have to borrow one from your own doctor, um, which is probably a good thing, don't you think? <laughs> um, endoscopy lets us look inside these hollow vessels and see things uh, that we would not have seen otherwise, that we can see things uh, visually on the surface that even uh, CT scanning uh, does not show in detail. Uh, endoscopy turns out to be a very good tool for determining the repair <coughs> history of a piece and also helps us look at uh, uh, variables that may be associated with authenticity. Um, using electron microscopy, and we've been able to do some of that. We can do elemental mapping. We can look at, for example, uh, the mineral constituency of pigments on these pieces. And that may again help us tell where a piece came from, uh, both in terms of geography and maybe different workshops uh, <coughs> by different, uh, by different uh, ceramicists. Um, just recently, we've been doing some residue analysis, the residues that are on the insides of some of these vessels, um, and, and hopefully what we will be able to identify are what, what are the, the liquids, what are the foods, what are the, uh, the other kinds of things that may have been stored inside these vessels. Archaeologists are very good about describing ceramic vessels, but it seems to me one of the things we should be also very interested in is what those vessels held. That's going to tell you about what they were eating. That's going to tell you, hopefully, some detail about the rituals that they may have been involved in. I can tell you, uh, and this will be in the exhibit, that in some of the West Mexican figures, uh, tested by uh, Adam King and Terry Powis and, and their team, uh, they have found evidence of datura, which is a, a, a hallucinogen. Well, isn't that interesting? 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Um, and it's not in all vessels, it's in a, a fairly limited number, uh, but it also seems to suggest that there are certain vessel forms in which you find datura and other vessels do not have it. So again, we may be sort of centering in on some ritual. Here's one that I'm hopeful for because of my forensic interest, but I have to tell you so far it's been a total dead end. Uh, that sometimes happens. Um, Years ago, I started looking at these ceramic figures, hoping to isolate fingerprints on the exteriors of the pots so that we could lift them off and, and uh, uh, analyze them. And, and what would we do with fingerprints? Well, there are a couple of things. Are there differences between male and female fingerprints? Wouldn't it be nice to know who is making the pottery? Is it men or is it women or is it both? Would it be possible to look at ceramic figures that were in the same style if you could identify different works by the same potter. Yeah, that'd be kind of important to know. We also know that West Mexico and indeed most other archaeological areas are plagued with fakery. So one of the other things that we were going to do, and may still do, is to see if we could create a database of known fake fingerprints. That might be a helpful tool in the future as well. So the point is, Today, we are blessed with a, a huge array of technologies that come from lots of different fields. Um, they all have benefits and they all have their limitations. And the question for us as researchers is which of these techniques are going to contribute to the work that we're doing? Now, the good part of virtually all of these, in fact, all of them, they're non-destructive. We don't 
We're not taking little samples out. We're not breaking anything off. Uh, with residue analysis, yeah, we're doing a little scraping of residue. But that's pretty minor. And that's the residue. That's not the pottery itself. So what that means is we can use the techniques that are available to us today, but what can the next generation of scientists do? They can apply, they can apply the techniques that will be even better than what we're using today to address some of the same questions or to maybe verify or refute the interpretations that we're coming up with. So that's how good science works. You know, um, I've never heard a scientist who says, I pursue truth. If you want to do that, talk to a priest or a rabbi. <laughs> they, they do, or a philosopher. They do truth. We try to test data and hypotheses. And that's why for each generation, it's important to look at these over and over again. That's one of the benefits, by the way, of a terrific collection here at the Gilcrease Museum. It has been here for a long time. I've looked at West Mexican pieces from the Field Museum, and they were collected for the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Those figures still have value in this kind of research. It's not done. Okay? So, that's what we try to do. Well, you may have seen this before. This is our little uh, medical endoscope. Um, thanks to uh, Roger Johnson, a medical doctor, a uh, friend of mine from, uh, from Texas, who I met years ago and, and uh, offered this uh, opportunity to uh, use his endoscope. And then when he retired, he donated the setup. And as some of you have seen who work down in anthropology, uh, it's a tabletop apparatus. It's uh, a lot of pieces and it's really heavy and now it doesn't work at all because it's really old. Um, the good news is, thanks to uh, a benefactor in, uh, in Colorado, I've been able to purchase a new digital portable endoscope, which is going to be much, much better to go look at collections in other museums and allow us to capture images. What we're looking at here is a tiny snail shell. You could put that snail shell on your little fingernail. It's that small. Um, I'm trying to get some better images of it. I'm working with a malacologist, those are the folks who, uh, who analyze snails, to see if we can determine the genus and species of that. Why would we be interested in the genus and species? What is that going to tell us? Well, these little guys are very delicate. And they, they live in a very small range of temperature and humidity. You get outside that range, one population dies off, and it may be replaced by another population. If we can identify the genus and species, we can tell something about where, about the environmental characteristics of that snail, which then tells us something about the figure to which that snail is adhered. So this gets away a little bit from sort of standard archaeology, but it's also part of the collaboration that makes ex that makes archaeology in the 21st century pretty exciting. Well, probably you've all heard me talk much more about the insect puparia more than you would ever want, uh, which I understand. Here is uh, here are some examples of these little uh, insect puparia. Here's a close-up of one that's heavily mineralized. These two tell us something about the environment, the micro-environment uh, of the tomb where these objects come from. Um, also, these puparia are organic. We have gotten uh, C14 dates based on those. And you can't C14 date the pottery because it's inorganic. So we, we use the bug casings to get the dates. We've also been doing uh, some DNA analysis to see if we can, again, identify the genus and species of these particular insects because each of these insects has its own sort of environmental characteristics that we would like to know about. Sometimes we find things that make us very excited and then our hopes are dashed to pieces. Um, these are inside one of the Gilcrease ceramic vessels. They look like this. Uh, we found these at about uh, half a dozen ceramic vessels uh, here at the museum and uh, at a, a small museum over in Arkansas. And I was totally excited by these because these are complete and unbroken. They're the whole thing. 
And so uh, when we found these and were able to extract these, I sent them to a forensic entomologist friend of mine at the Maples uh, Forensic Center down in Gainesville, Florida. And he quickly writes back and he says, uh, yeah, these are bugs, but these are from, uh, these are Otheca, meaning egg cases, as opposed to a puparium. And by the way, they're from the Asian cockroach. <laughs> Asian cockroach, ancient West Mexico. They don't go together. This is an introduced species after European contact. What that means is these date probably to the time of the looting of these vessels, not to the time when these vessels were actually placed in the tomb environment. So we have to be very careful. Even when we find interesting things, we have to find out what do those interesting things mean. And it's certainly a lot more fun when we find out that we're right instead of finding out that you know, this is really not what we want to know, this is not what we want to see. But again, that's how science works. If you knew everything you were going to find before you went in, there'd be no reason to do it. Okay, uh, residue analysis. Um, here, uh, the team, oops, sorry. The team is using a, um, what was that called? The, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a fancy term which I can't remember. Uh, essentially putting um, um, water in here uh, and sort of vibrating the object which loosens the uh, detritus and the residue inside. Uh, it can then be taken out and then it, it's taken to a lab uh, to analyze to see what's, what's in there. That's how Detura was found uh, in this vessel. Interestingly, this same team of people have uh, found cacao, chocolate, and chili in some other vessels in Mesoamerica and also at Chaco Canyon. Now, since that time, there has been a little discussion about chocolate and chili. Um, one of the things that tells us is that when things are in museum collections for a long time, it's a really good idea not to expose them to cigarette smoke, to coffee, to chocolate, or to any other kinds of things that might um, uh, sort of fall in and on these vessels. These techniques are now so precise that if you were, if you had chocolate or chili around these in storage, you might start finding some residue on the vessels. That's kind of scary. But anyway, that's, that's how this works. Cat scanning. Here's, uh, here's our little friend, uh, the dog, uh, the Kalima dog with the human face at, at St. John's Hospital. And here's a CT scan. Um, this again uh, is an interesting story, but it's not the one we wanted. Uh, this you may have seen at the museum at various times on display, and it's been published. Um, Cheryl and I, when we uh, got the endoscope from uh, Roger Johnson, this is one of the first pieces we wanted to look at. It is very unusual. There's a, a piece that's very similar to this that was pictured in a publication in about 1889. Okay, uh, it's an old piece. Um, there are lots of Kalima dogs. There are very few that have human face masks. The uh, uh, firing hole, if you will, this is a hollow figure. The firing hole is in the ear. Okay, so when we got our endoscope, we we looked inside the body in this area and the body on the inside looked pretty good. It, it seemed to have the characteristics of age and antiquity that we would expect. We turned the endoscope around into the face, and it looked like plaster. That is not a good sign. So we were concerned. You know, Clearly, it has had some repair. But the question is, is it a repair, or is it a total replacement? Well based on that sort of initial look with the endoscope, we were able to go to St. John's and CAT scan it and hold the tail. The face is a complete fabrication. That's a pretty sophisticated fake for the 1950s. So uh, for those of you who, who think, golly, if you collected something that's been in a private collection for a couple of decades, it's probably genuine. Nah, there were people faking things forever. <laughs> so, 
It's not exactly what we wanted to find out, but it's important that we find out because it's important that we know what our collections are. Okay? Um, here's where Cheryl comes in. Cheryl has a considerable artistic talent and also a computer program that is used in, in designing clothes. And uh, we talked about a simple question. What would a figurine look like if it was a person? My sense is, when you're looking at the figurines, you're kind of drawn to what I call the figurineness of the object. You're looking at the oddities, you're looking at uh, you know, the, the curious head, and, and uh, you also find that some of the detail is, is obscured by 2,000 years of patina and, and detritus that, uh, that's on the surface. So Cheryl and uh, Aubrey Hayden, who's also uh, working here, um, their task was to take these figures and as close as they could to the design and the color to reproduce the clothing and the body decoration. Body decoration meaning body painting and body tattooing. And uh, so they, they developed a couple of hundred of these. This is really significant. This is another whole project in and of itself to start looking at the detail of under what circumstances were men wearing this outfit? Were they always wearing this sort of conical hat, which by the way, in our collection has enough detail, you can tell that it was a wicker hat. It has the detail on it that shows the, uh, the weft, weft and warp, or whatever that is, uh, of the basketry in the hat. So this is a significant advance into trying to determine what these figures really represent. Well, that's the science part. And then the third part is on, uh, third part of the exhibit, is on um, the attraction, the, the use of ancient West Mexican figures and other Mesoamerican figures by modern and contemporary artists. Uh, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera were both great proponents of, of Mexico's ancient cultures. It was part of their indigenismo. Uh, perspective. The, the, essentially, a, a, a paraphrase would be sort of the power of the people, of the ancient people. Uh, and they incorporated figures. Here's a, a figure from West Mexico. Uh, here's a traditional uh, Ixcuintli, show Ixcuintli dog, um, which is probably the same dog that was being portrayed by those, those little red uh, bat dogs that we see as ceramic figures. Uh, and we see European artists who were also uh, using some of those blocky styles in their, own, uh, in their own artwork, and they were considered geniuses, but they were borrowing stuff that was already 1,000 to 2,000 years old. We find West Mexico in popular culture. Some of you may remember in the 70s and 80s, the Kahlua ads, okay? Uh, it turns out that John Stern, you remember the, uh, the uh, Riverside, uh, the California Impressionism exhibit that we did? John Stern is the director of that museum. He was also a student working in West Mexico in the 70s and was the curator for the Berman collection. And Mr. Berman was the guy who owned Kahlua. So we've been able to gather a little interesting information about that, a little tidbit of popular culture. Uh, you may recognize North by Northwest, Alfred Hitchcock's movie. And there's a West Mexican figure, although a really bad one. Uh, in uh, a little more recently, Pirates of the Caribbean, the, the Black Pearl, uh, in the Great Pirate Horde, there was a gold figure. Well, uh, it looks very much like that. Okay. So my point of that is, is that in in serious art and in popular culture, uh, these West Mexican figures still have power. They still have a story to tell, and we think that it's it's very appropriate to talk about those things in our exhibition, even though the balance of the exhibit is really about uh, the ancient people. Well, here are a couple of the contemporary artists. This may be a little difficult to see. These are tires, as you can well see. What's a little difficult to see is in, in engraved in this is a Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent. Not all that different from this feathered serpent. You see the eye? You see the open mouth? This is a feathered serpent that's on a little spindle, stone spindle whirl about that big, which will also be in the exhibit. Okay, it's from West Mexico. 
Well, here's the floor plan of the exhibit, and you probably can't see it in detail, so I won't uh, <coughs> dwell too much on it for right now. But let me make this point. Uh, this is just sort of a very brief introduction to, uh, to the exhibit in West Mexico. What I was saying earlier before the lecture started is I will be happy to spend some time with, with the Gillies who are going to be doing tours through here, uh, be thinking of the questions that you think you will be asked, be thinking of the questions you would like to have answered, and we will meet again at some point to, to either do this in more of a, a lecture section or to do a walkthrough of the exhibit. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, thanks to Cheryl again, who has great design skills, um, all of these are display cases. You can see the objects that are in each display case. Uh, each of these are, are divided by theme and color. Um, this is kind of an organ organized way to do an exhibit plan, if you ask me. Um, books, we like books. We're doing three books. Um, this is the visual guide to uh, West Mexican figures. Cheryl and I have actually completed that about a year and a half ago. Uh, we have been circulating it to some of our academic peers uh, in the U.S. and Mexico to see if they find it useful. Uh, we're actually going to probably create about 100 or so hard copies of this for sale, and then it may be available um, as, a, as an e-book or a print-on-demand book. Um, I think this is a wonderful thing, but I realize you will never see it on the New York Times bestsellers list, so <laughs> we're, we're going to do a small run. Um, this is the, oops, this is the uh, cover uh, for the catalog of the exhibit. It will change uh, slightly because this guy doesn't have his arm and his fan is broken off, so we're going to replace that image. But uh, uh, this will be the catalog that will be relatively short text blocks, interpretive text blocks, and lots of images. In the back of the catalog, every object in the exhibit will be pictured and described. Okay. This is the cover for the academic volume that we're doing. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 14 articles in this uh, representing field work and analysis and, and interpretation of figures uh, from scholars that represent four or five different countries. So. I think that's probably the end. And if I remember to do what Neil showed me how to do, I have another little toy for you to see. Uh, let's see. Let's see how this works. First, we close this out. Oh. I've been working with some students of Professor Diaz on campus who do, uh, who do computer engineering. This is a 3D model of one of the figures uh, in our exhibition and in our collection. Uh, hopefully we will be able to have some of this available uh, during the exhibit so that you can actually manipulate it instead of just watching it uh, turn around like it's on its own perpetual lazy suit. So with that I will finish my comments and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions if I can. Thank you. Bob, I've heard that many, I'm talking all of the tabloids, you know, have been reconstructed in some way. That they were in pieces and, and were put back together. Um, anytime you have archaeological material, there are going to be repairs. I would say that the tableaus all show some repair, but some show some fairly major replacements, some are not. Um, uh, again, uh, it's important when you're using these tableaus to really figure out what's original and what isn't. But I would still say that given the ones we have and the information, there's a huge amount of information there that just has not really been mined well. So that's that's going to be the next step. I, I will also say that, that mounting this exhibit, I hope, is not the end of the work I do in West Mexico. It's sort of a, uh, uh, a way stop on the way. The next phase will be doing more research. Um, one of the little tidbits you may or may not be interested in is um, Cheryl and I have come up with about 74 variables to examine on each of these figures, and we now have about 1,500 figures in our database. Uh, my goal over the next three years is to get that database up to about 5,000 figures. 
Uh, we have looked at collections in seven different museums around the country, including in Gilcrease, and I hope to have that up to uh, 15 or 20 different museum collections around the country. And if I can make the arrangements, maybe we will spend some time in Mexico looking at collections down there as well. So we, we, we are continually figuring out what's real and what's not. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, kind of a related question. With all the science you can bring to bear on this and the work that's been done to prepare the audience for the exhibition, what have you learned about the integrity of the Gilcrease collection from repairs to outright fakes? Um, there are very few outright fakes in the collection. There are a number of things that have been repaired. There are a number of pieces that have major replacements, some that have been overpainted and enhanced. Um, you know, uh, over the years, starting really back in the 1980s, I've, I've been interested in this question of, of authenticity, and I've had the opportunity in a couple of cases to spend some time with, with uh, ceramicists who made modern figures, but of course they would never sell them as fakes. That would be totally unethical. Um, but they surely seem to know a lot about the ancient figures and how to make the new ones look like the old ones. Um, I have great respect for those folks. They are artistically talented. The ones I talk to are very well read. They have very good libraries. They see more real stuff than any archaeologist, and they do this stuff every day. So there's sort of a continuous cat and mouse game between archaeologists and scientists and the fakers. When they look what we're when they figure out what we're looking for, and usually we tell them in an article, they figure out how to fix that. So by using some of these technologies, uh, we're not going to stop the problem, but maybe we raise the bar high enough for a while so that we can identify fake and modified pieces from the past. So that's kind of the goal. Is this exhibit not be on display in any other museums or just Gilchrist? Just Gilchrist. Uh, on the book, you had the title Gilchrist and Ancient America series, so is it on the other book? We that? surely hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a, a very short series if we did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, they are all subject to Mexico's antiquities law, and if we were ever to get a request from the Mexican government saying we want those things back, then we would probably uh, comply. Um, but, uh, you know, there are lots of collections in the U.S. and other countries, and um, Mexico is one of those cultures, one of those countries that's sort of antiquities poor. Um, it's very sad that virtually all of these things have been looted. I would be much happier if we had lots of field data around these. There are questions that we could answer with that that we cannot answer right now. Um, but in terms of, of uh, complying with international laws, yes, we do that. Uh, what percentage? Probably 15, 20 percent, maybe. Now, it's probably the best 15 or 20 percent. Uh, there are some things that you won't see that are not so dramatic, uh, but it's 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 sort of the best of the collection. You can certainly say that. The subtitle on the book said a reassessment. Is there a uh, headline or a way you could capture that? What are we reassessing? That's a very good question. Here's, here's the deal. When I was a student, there were sort of two main scholars, well that's not true, there were a couple of scholars who were doing some significant work. Hasso von Winning, uh, who was very much in the art history tradition, and he used the term anecdotal sculpture, that these are scenes of everyday life. Uh, that they are essentially as close to snapshots as we will get from the past. Interesting idea. There was Peter First, who came from Southern California and was very much in the, how shall we say, the Carlos Castaneda uh, uh, spirit of the 60s. And he tended to interpret these West Mexican figures uh, through uh, shamanism and the use of psychedelics. And his point was, no, these are not 
mundane everyday figures. These are spiritual figures that, uh, for example, the warrior figure that I showed you, he said, uh, well, those are not real warriors, those are spirit warriors. And you can tell because they're always facing left. And after all, uh, uh, traditionally, evil always comes from the left. Well, yeah, that's true if you're from Europe, uh, which is an old historic tradition. I'm not really sure the West Mexicans shared that same European sentiment. So, so here are two sort of diametrically opposed views. One is sort of physical art history interpretation. Another is sort of cultural, mythological interpretation. Both of their works suffered from small samples. Both of their works suffered from, how shall we say, selective analysis. What we're trying to do is to look at the whole body of work and to see if there's not a third way to analyze these. It's not that either of them were totally wrong, but neither of them were totally right, if, if that's helpful. So yes, this is a reassessment. And, and what Mark said earlier is true. I mean, part of my goal in this whole project, uh, and it's something I've been interested in for, for 30 years in the museum world, well, ever since NAGPRA came to be, is what is the value of long-term archaeology collections in museums? And if the only value is to put them on display to see without interpretation, I don't think that's good enough. I think that's, that's not honoring the ancient people who made these things. It's not telling us how these things were made or used. They're just kind of there, you know. So, so my intent has, has been to try to use new and different scientific techniques to at least partially recontextualize these pieces to see what we can tell about the figures uh, based on, on detailed observation. So it's kind of a forensic approach to an archaeological question, if that makes any sense. How many of these figures actually came from the shaft tomb research? How many figures came from shaft tombs? Yes. Well, if you had asked me that question a couple of years ago, I probably would have said 100%. However, uh, my colleague Chris Beekman has been doing work on habitation sites and finding fragmentary figures in the habitation sites. They're not in shaft tombs. What this is leading us to is, is, I think, sort of interesting in terms of interpreting these figures. What do they represent? They may have been used in rituals above ground before people died, but like the remains, their final repository was the shaft tomb. One of the variables we've been looking at is use wear on the bottoms of these figures. Well, guess what? Some of them show evidence of having been moved around. They've been used. They've been handled. That suggests that, that they had uh, uh, literally a life of their own before they were ever deposited in the tomb. That totally changes how we look at these things. You know, one of the things that I'm kind of intrigued by is what, in fact, do these represent? Do these represent real people? Do these represent sort of abstract ancestors, the, uh, the original uh, father and mother kind of thing, the original ancestors? Do they represent deities? My sense is some of them may indeed represent individuals, but individual achieved statuses. When you see the male figures, carrying different accoutrements and being in different body postures, maybe a warrior, maybe a, a singer, maybe a, 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 a someone carrying a, a ball, a ball game player. These may be achieved statuses that this person has, has developed in life, and this group of figures is commemorating these achieved statuses in death. <coughs> maybe for the female figures, same thing that the body posture, the accoutrement, the idea that she's holding a bowl. I don't think she's just holding a bowl. I think that has another meaning, uh, maybe of support or, or whatever. But that these, these postures and figures are commemorating the life history of, of these people. Now, there are other figures where I don't think that's true at all. 
And I think one of the things we fall into in the 21st century is just because they're all holoceramic figures, we figure they're all used in the same way. Huh? I don't think so. I don't think that's true at all. Okay, the um, shells, first of all, <coughs> mm -hmm. your antler, mm -hmm. you think those were used like a drum? Mm -hmm. You bet. And are those, any of those objects found in the tombs also for the excavation? Looters wouldn't be interested in those. So they do not get represented in very many museum collections. I don't know any that I've seen in museum collections. But I've seen that figure, seated male, turtle shell, antler, in probably at least a half a dozen or more figures from different museums. So they have no tombs, unlooted tombs, been discovered? Um, a few have. I uh, Back in the 90s, I did the skeletal analysis uh, at the Huitzilapa tomb, which is probably the <coughs> most elaborate shaft tomb to be excavated by archaeologists. It had a shaft of about nine meters, and it had two tomb rooms off to the side, three individuals in each of the two rooms, um, and it was pretty spectacular. And that's actually where I got interested in these figures, because I started seeing indications that they occurred in sets. And you have male figures with a male skeleton and female figures with a female skeleton. And only a physical anthropologist would note this, but on some of the figures, they seem to have all of their teeth. On other figures, they didn't seem to have all their teeth. And on some of the figures, they had no teeth at all. Well, I can tell you, before about World War II, the number of teeth in your head was an indicator of how old you were. You know, So could they not actually put teeth in all of these figures? No, they were doing that on purpose. They were used, I think, they were using that as one of the indicators of age. So it, it sort of gave me this, this thought that these are representing different accomplishments during life. And that's sort of what really started this project long ago. Um, do you have any other um, technology applications that you have your eyes on that you would like to be able to use? more residue analysis um, to actually be able to use our, X, our portable XRF to do trace element analysis on, on paints and pigments. Uh, we just haven't had time to do that. Once the exhibit is done, I hope we kind of swing back into a research phase uh, to start addressing some of these things. And to be very honest, now that I'm on campus and in the anthropology department, I may have a better opportunity to attract graduate students who are looking for master's theses and dissertation topics so that they do the grunt work and I don't have to. <laughs> Did you find any of these figures, uh, or figurines, or, to be uh, identical figurines from different locations? Oh, the alley. Um, or nearly identical? Yes, and yes. There are some figures that you see time and time again. Now, there are some you don't see often. One of the ones that I know you all know is the little guy that's sort of seated with his hand on his nose. Yeah. I've never seen that anywhere else. And I'm 99% I'm sure that's a genuine figure. I have no clue what that represents. <laughs> now, there are some other figures that show the hand over the mouth. There are some figures that show a hand behind the head. But that's different from this. I don't know what that means. I know what it looks like from our perspective, <laughs> but that's not it, I don't think. So, so you do find this. One of the things that you hear from the looters is that sometimes in shaft tombs, they will find figurines of different style in the same tomb. That would be really significant if it were true, but there's no record, there's no data. These are looted samples. What is true, and this comes from my colleague, uh, Chris Beekman, who has been doing extensive site survey in, in West Mexico, is every site and every structure in every site that he has surveyed has been looted. So the opportunity to find a pristine site to do the kind of archeological analysis that we would like to do is harder and harder. And to be honest, the looters are often better equipped than the archaeologists, and they have more time. And in the last 20 years, they're armed. 
There are places in West Mexico I would love to go back to and probably won't. It's just not a good idea. So, you know, it's an aspect of archaeology you don't often think about, but in West Mexico it's an issue. The reassessment that this exhibit helped generate, what's the single biggest surprise for you, for someone who's been in this for 30 plus years, you know, wow, I would have never drank that, but that makes sense. I think, and again, this is just sort of emerging, that, that these figures, which we have all lumped together as hollow ceramic figures, and by the way, that you, yeah, you sort of brought it up, when I talk about large hollow figures, I call those figures. If I talk about the small solid human forms, I call those figurines. Kind of arbitrary, but that's just kind of how I do it. Um, but to get to your point, the idea that that we think of all these large hollow figurines as if they were one and the same function and purpose. I don't think that's true. They're not no, no. They were used for different purposes by different groups. And maybe within the same group, hollow figurines were used different. I mean, sort of on one level, ceramic is just a medium. That's all it is. So clay is a medium that you make things for what you need. Well, if they need hollow figurines for different things, they probably need them. But to get, a, get away from this idea that somehow these are all shaft tomb figures and that they were all, uh, uh, they all had one single purpose. Not so. Do you feel like these uh, figurines are, and I don't know the terminology, are they memory markers? Are they made to remind people of what is or what was? Well, one of the things to consider is uh, death is not the end. One of the things about the shaft, some of the shaft tombs, the shafts come up to the floors of the living sites of the houses. And it could be that this is a way that the world above communicates with the world below. So mom and dad are still down there. You know, when you see some of these house models, you see people doing activities up in the main part of the house, but then there may be a lower level, and often you see very stylized uh, figures uh, sitting. It may be that they are depicting the world below. They are depicting their ancestors in the tomb. So they are not gone just because they're dead. They're still communicating. They're still part of the culture. That's kind of an interesting idea. Yes, ma'am. Last week on NPR, I caught the very, very tail end of a piece on satellite images that are unlocking secrets to our hidden past. Um, you see great promise in that, I assume. Uh, Beekland uses those uh, to find West Mexican sites. Yeah. It, it, it can be done. In, I think one had to be done. The, yeah. Remember, I caught the tail end of it. I, the, the, I, I heard the same story. That she was working in Egypt and, and the Near East. Okay. But you can use that technology in other places, particularly uh, you know, dry places or, or places that, that have, uh, how do I really want to say this, uh, that aren't necessarily full of rocky uh, uh, substrate. You can use those techniques pretty, pretty successfully. So yes, that's being done, absolutely. So what it means is when you're doing site survey, you can, you can go to those places that you find first by uh, uh, remote sensing and then go look at the site in detail to try to verify if indeed that's a, that's a site. In the latest um, Smithsonian, there's a really interesting article about finding a uh, major architectural site that predates Angkor Wat and doing it in the same way, looking under the forest, essentially. So, one last question, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Do ceramic production skills differ in different parts of the world so that South America, Mexico, West Mexico are uniquely different in the material or production techniques, or how do they learn that stuff? Cheryl? She, among other things, she's a ceramicist. I guess, you know, when it comes to clay, you have to work with what you've got right there wherever you're living. It's not a very portable source. So as far as the, the material you're using, you're kind of at the mercy of that. And 
what you can add to it to enhance the whole case. As far as technical ability, uh, I mean, that's, that's something that each artist has individually, no matter where they are in the world. Uh, there are great potters and there are poor potters. Uh, and I think if you look at these ceramic pieces, you can tell the difference between all of them, that this person is a master, and well, this this person may work with them, and they don't quite achieve that that excellence. You see that in every other medium as well. That, that's a really important point with museum collections. I mean, what do museums want to collect? Yeah. They want to collect the best of the best. Well, that's great if your perspective is only art, but if you're a researcher, that's you're dead in the water. You don't have any variation. One of the great things about the Gilcrease collection, um, the Field Museum collection from 1892, basically, or the Hudson Museum collection up in uh, University of Maine in Orono, is that the people who put those collect who put those collections together, for good or ill, were interested in variety and not necessarily just having the best of the best. So what we see is this variation of manufacture, which indicates not everybody went to the the best artisan to get their figures done. You know, it may be for the social elites. They had access to the elite ceramicists. Everybody else, for whatever ritual purposes, may have needed these figures. But they went down the road to Aunt Mary or Uncle Joe and said, can you make some figures for me? Uh, I mean, there are, there are huge differences in quality of these. And yes, that's a value judgment, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's demonstrated. So what that means is the manufacture of these figures was probably done wherever people lived, and they were not simply coming to one source to get their figures. That also indicates to me that uh, these rituals are important, but they were not necessarily localized in one place. That the rituals they were used in existed wherever the people existed, whether it's in the, the, the major polities or the small farming hamlets. So that helps us kind of think about the size and the structure of this society. So thank you all. You've been very patient and have asked good questions.